One of humanity's greatest achievements in space is the construction of the International Space Station. It currently consists of modules from 42 separate assembly flights over more than 20 years, with almost 100 docking ports in use between them. It has 18 pressurized modules with a volume of 932 cubic meters that astronauts can move between without obstructions. To enable this, mechanisms are used that can rigidly interlock those systems with a pressure-tight seal for many years can withstand the space station maneuvering and can be detached and reconfigured on orbit. These docking and berthing mechanisms have a long and interesting history in design lineage. The first docking of two spaceships in history was performed during Gemini 8 when the Gemini spacecraft maneuvered into the docking cone of a waiting satellite built specifically as a docking target, called the Agena Target Vehicle. For this, the pilot manually lines the Gemini capsule to the Agena and slowly flies into it. The shape of the cone corrects small alignment errors between the two vehicles. Additionally, the indexing bar, a metal pin extended from the Gemini, corrects roll alignment by being guided through a V-shaped receptacle in the docking cone. The docking cone is placed on flexible dampeners and is thus aligned to the Gemini passively by those two vehicles moving together while also softening the impact. Three latches located behind the docking cone are triggered by the Gemini moving into them and locking the two spacecraft together. Once all of them are engaged, the entire cone is pulled into the Agena, compressing the dampeners and rigidly locking the spacecraft together. No electrical connection between the spacecraft are made and crew transfer is also not possible, but the Agena was used to perform attitude control for the coupled system and boost the Gemini's orbit. For undocking, the rigidization mechanism is extended again and the latch is released. This also allows for reset in case the docking did not go as planned and had to be repeated. In case of an undocking failure, the latch receptacles on the Germany spacecraft could also be pyrotechnically separated. Okay, Germany 8, uh, we have TM solid. You're looking good on the ground. Go ahead and dock. Okay. I think we're going to hold off on this SPC thing until he does get docked. Okay, go ahead with your memory compare. Roger. Let us know what you get out of that. Flight, we are down. That was it. Two vehicles dock for the first time in space. Two, one, zero, all engine running. Liftoff! We have a liftoff! The Gemini missions, however, were only test run for the more complex Apollo ones. When going to the moon, there were two dockings and undockings between the command module and the lunar excursion module, or LIM. Astronauts have to transfer between the vehicles through an airtight tunnel, and power and data is shared between both. The docking port uses a design called Probe and Drogue, where Probe, the command module, enters a drogue or cone on the lunar module. The command module is piloted in front of the lunar module, with the alignment being indicated to the crew through an alignment target on the limb. The drogue is then guided into the cone, where capture ledges poke through the hole at the tip of the cone, engaging and preliminarily locking the two spacecraft together. The engagement of the latches is indicated in the command module control panel. Valves to pressurize nitrogen bottles inside the docking probe assembly are then opened, pressurizing pistons in that assembly, causing it to retract. This pulls the spacecraft together, even compressing the rubber seals that keep air in the tunnel after docking. Twelve latches are then engaged, locking the two spacecraft firmly together. After leak checks, the hatches between the spacecraft can be opened. The probe and drogue assemblies can be removed from the tunnel and stored inside the spacecraft. The astronauts then manually connect power and data connectors through the tunnel of the two spacecraft. When undocking for lunar landing, the drogue and the probe in the retracted position are reinstalled in the tunnel, the hatches closed, the tunnel decompressed, and the latches detached. When abandoning the LEM at the moon, the probe and drogue assemblies are not reinstalled but stored in the LEM. And instead of releasing the latches, the detonation cord around the command module side of the docking tunnel cuts it, leaving a bit attached to the limb. The same docking mechanism was used for the Apollo Skylab missions, with the docking cone now being installed in the Skylab space station. Deviation along the roll axis to the left. 
At around the same time as the Americans, the Soviets had to solve the same problems for their upcoming space station and lunar missions. The result they came up with is structurally similar to the Apollo design. There was a system for the LOK-LK lunar missions that was never flown in space, and a probe and rock design only used once for an automated docking test. But the main workhorse is a docking system called SSVP. Система стыковки и внутреннего перехода. It was used in almost all Soyuz and Progress missions as well as the European ATV transfer vehicle. The SSVP uses a probe and rogue docking system similar to what we've seen on the Apollo. The approach can once again be done using a docking target, but it's usually flown using the Curse docking navigation system. Here the probe's ball sits on a long screw that itself sits on a spring inside the shaft. The screw is extended before docking and the spring dampens the impact of docking when the ball seeks the end of the cone where it engages latches, soft capturing the two spacecraft together. The screw is then retracted to pull the two spacecraft together where the skirt fine aligns the pitch in your directions. Slots in the cone are shaped in such a way that they fine align the roll direction. A pin in the hard docking ring nullifies any remaining alignment issues before a ring of latches hard docks the two spacecraft. The docking ring also has connectors for power and data transfer and the Progress spacecraft can even transfer fuel to the space station. After docking, the pressure in the tunnels equalized and the probe and the cone pivot into their respective spacecraft. For undocking, the hatches are closed and the probe can be extended, compressing the spring and thus pushing the spacecraft apart once the latches are released. At Mission Control Moscow, Flight controllers monitor Soyuz as it gathers momentum en route to orbital altitude. Less than nine minutes after launch, Soyuz, powered by triple booster stages, is inserted into its assigned orbit. Three, Three two, two, engine one, sequence start. Zero. One, zero, launch commit. We have a liftoff. All engines building up thrust. Moving out. Clear the tower. Uh, roger, power clear. As tensions in the Cold War ease, the Apollo-Soyuz test project was supposed to be a sign of cooperation between the two superpowers. It was a mission when Apollo spacecraft and the Soyuz would dock in space, exchanging gifts and cooperatively performing science experiments. A common standard was needed so engineers of both sides worked together to create APAS, the Androgynous Peripheral Attach System, or this particular system was retroactively renamed APAS 75 after the year of its inception. The system is different from the ones we've seen before as the system is androgynous. Any APAS 75 port can dock to any other, although at least one spacecraft has to assume an active role. The active spacecraft pushes forward a guide ring on flexible dampeners, which aligns itself to the other side through alignment petals. Capture latches in the petals soft capture both systems. The ring is then carefully retracted, aligning a docking ring very similar to the Soyuz SSVP-1. It also uses a guide pin for fine alignment and a set of eight latches on either side. After tunnel pressurization and leak checks, hatches in both spacecraft can be opened. Springs retracted during the hard docking phase push the spacecraft apart once the latch is opened. Alright, on a show, Hawk Revive, you look free. Okay, the camera. Ha -ha!
This picture now from the Mir space station showing the approach of the two uh, docking mechanisms toward each other. Atlantis 10 feet from the Mir, time to docking, 1 minute 50 seconds. The APAS-89 system was originally developed for the Soviet Buran shuttle. The SSVP used on the Soyuz would not have been able to dampen the impact of the heavy shuttle against the heavy station. It is very similar to the APA-75 system, but the petals point inward, and instead of the guide ring being passively dampened, it is electrically pushed forward to exert a stopping force between the spacecraft. One Soyuz spacecraft has used this mechanism for tests on Mir, but it is not used for regular operations, as it is over 100 kilograms heavier than the SSVP mechanisms used otherwise. The US Space Shuttle uses an even new iteration called APAS-95, originally for docking to Mir, and later the ISS. Houston Atlantis, we have capture. We're lucky and we're honored and privileged to be part of this. Uh, it's great to be back joined in orbit again. While the shuttle remains docked to the station, power and data are carried over cables through the docking tunnel. In this footage you can also clearly see the inward pointing alignment pedals inside the tunnel. <laughs> Welcome aboard the station. Hey, you guys wore coordinating shirts. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't do that. It's okay. Who is ready for final approach? A multinational board created the International Docking System Standard, IDSS, that is yet another evolution of APAS. There are multiple compatible implementations of this, such as the NASA Docking System, NDS, and ESA's International Berthing and Docking Mechanism. Potentially, the Chinese crew capsules and space station's docking mechanism is compatible as well, but the China National Space Administration has never confirmed this. The Hubble Space Telescope additionally has a soft capture ring of the NASA docking system which berthed it to the space shuttle. The mechanism is used on the crew and updated cargo Dragon spacecraft and on the yet-to-dock Starliner and Orion spacecraft. After docking, connectors around the docking ring can be extended between the spacecraft to keep them charged and exchange data. This picture also clearly shows the latches in the alignment petals that soft capture the guide ring, common to all APAS derivatives. Dragon SpaceX on the big loop, soft capture confirmed. There is a variety of variants of the Soyuz docking system SSVP. Notably, many of the larger Russian modules on the International Space Station use a combination of the SSVP docking cone and the APAS-89 hard docking ring called SSVP M8000. However, the international modules of the space station are connected using the Common Berthing Mechanism, or CBM. In berthing, the module is first grappled by a robotic arm and then precisely and carefully connected to the target, removing the need for a guide ring, cones and dampening mechanism. The CBM has an interior diameter of 1.8 meters, significantly larger than the 80 centimeters of the Apollo, SSVP and APAS systems. It has different small alignment petals in distinct active or passive sides. An active port can only be berthed to a passive one and vice versa. Four control modules inside the active port control the activation of four latches and 16 powered bolts. These are disassembled and stored after the hatch opening. Only a square hatch inside the docking ring opens, allowing the routing of cables and the outer portions. This picture also shows the alignment petals. On the ISS this is usually covered by a fabric screen. Most ISS modules have been unloaded by robotic arms from the space shuttle's cargo bay. Canadarm 2 also grapples free-floating spacecraft using this berthing mechanism, Dragon, Cygnus and HTV, and berths them to their target ports. It connects the grappling fixtures all over modules on the International Space Station. The arm optically aligns its camera with the docking target and then uses snare wires on a ring to latch onto the target pin. 
The ring is then retracted, pulling the arms and effector onto the target, guiding it via three bridges. These also provide more rigidity, enabling the arm to move payloads weighing over 100 metric tons. Data connectors can be extended to some grappling fixtures, powering the payload. The robotic arm itself is connected to the ISS via this kind of grappling fixture, allowing it to release one end and connect it somewhere else, alternating which end is connected to the space station and thus traversing it like an inchworm. The new European robotic arm uses a different grappling fixture and is thus restrained to the Russian side of the station. One last interesting point to mention is mission extension vehicles, connecting to old satellites via a mechanism quite similar to the probe and rogue used in Apollo and Soyuz. It guides a lance into the engine of the target vehicle, which spreads its tip there so it cannot be removed, pulling the target satellite until they are rigidly connected. This allows to dock to a satellite that does not have any dedicated docking hardware, and might lead to a reduction of space debris in the future. While this will not replace any of the other docking ports, it still opens up many exciting new opportunities. Docking ports enabled the construction of megastructures such as the ISS and made the crude moon landings possible. Without them, space exploration would be very different.